I don't know how, how it was for you, but for me, summer was amazing. I mean, in the beginning, it was not that nice, but then I had a really good rest. I hope you too. Oh, today is autumn, but I would rather say a post-summer edition. Uh, this autumn, we are going to have another edition which is going to be dedicated to a Node.js. So, this one is the first of, uh, of a few. And today, topics are performance monitoring and uh, quite some cryptic, quirky JavaScript and a bit more. Oh, this meetup is brought to you by a uh, few nerds or just guys. Me, Dennis Redin, I'm a, a JavaScript so, uh, WebGL uh, engineer in Evolution Gaming. And uh, Jonas, Jonas is a software developer, probably very senior software developer in Reactor. And uh, Mikhail Larchanka, the guy on the camera, is uh, supplying online people with a picture and a sound. Yes, we are live on YouTube, so you may join any of our meetups on YouTube. Oh, now, Jonas, could you tell a bit more about our main sponsor? Yeah, sure. So you already uh, saw my face there and name, so no introduction needed, but hi to everybody. Um, so I guess I've seen a few familiar faces. Who here has heard of Reactor before? Just a show of hands. Okay, interesting. Uh, maybe one third closing, about half. Mm, good progress. <laughs> Okay, so um, about Reactor, just a few words. I don't want to be too too corporate with this, but Reactor is uh, originally a, a Finnish company. We're about 500 strong. That's kind of the key numbers. Uh, software consulting is what we do mostly, but also design and strategy stuff. So kind of all of those three three aspects. And uh, instead of leaving you just with the slash careers page, I thought that uh, maybe something interesting from our culture. We are a no hierarchy company. And I think a lot of uh, companies these days, at least they say it, but it's harder to live that than, than actually um, just say it. So flat and focus in teams. And what can come out of these kind of setups uh, is, for example, a thing that you see on the background uh, looks a bit, um, I don't know, what does it look like? Any guesses? Yes, good guess. <laughs> yeah, so it's a satellite. Uh, it's a small one. Uh, it's been now on orbit for, I think, 280 days. I don't know that many software companies of our size who have a satellite. And the story behind this is just that a couple of beers, a couple of guys, sauna, and they started thinking like, how hard can it be to, to build a satellite? Why don't we have one? Uh, can't be rocket science, can it? Well, uh, three years later, uh, turned out it, it is a bit of rocket science <laughs> involved for getting that into orbit, but it's been orbit now for 280 days. So, and there was no, company level decision of, yeah, just like, let's do a satellite program. No, it's just a couple of programmers, like most of you probably, who started pouring their hours towards this project and researching and yeah, this happened. But yeah, uh, like I promised, now you know about the satellite, hopefully that was a bit interesting and now I'm gonna leave the career page here. <laughs> but yeah, just come talk to me or, or check out the career space. I'll be hanging out after after the talks. Yeah. Are you looking for a first JavaScript -er to fly to the space, or is there a position for that? Or? Okay, so you're, you're looking for a Node.js developer with a space exploration experience. All right. Okay, yeah, if you're interested in this kind of position, please uh, uh, go to uh, reactor.com careers. And our second sponsor is AppCloud, which is a cloud hosting platform. And these people are trying to support JavaScript community in Amsterdam. Oh, uh, this meetup is happening partially because they uh, gave a bit of money for uh, everything what's, what's happening here, uh, food and drinks and uh, uh, the location rent, which also costs money. 
and uh, they propose us a promo code to try their uh, hosting service. So upcloud.com, you may try with a promo code UC25. I think you will get some uh, months of uh, hosting for free, which might be nice. Uh, always good. Yes, another big announcement for today. Now it's happening in a limited circle of us here, of Amsterdam JS. So the next year, GS Nation, Oh, GS Nation is a conference which uh, took its source in this meetup. Oh, it is an Amsterdam JS conference. Now it's called GS Nation. Oh, 2020, GS Nation is going to be the main happening on the GS stage globally. Oh, it's going to be really a different kind of event, global with a lot of stars. Uh, in, a, in a big venue with very intense program. It's uh, already a lot of people uh, committed of uh, superstars to take part. Uh, yeah, uh, it's like, I, ca I can speak a lot, but can I just play the... This? So yeah, it's going to happen in Amsterdam for two days. Amsterdam is going to be the capital, is global, worldwide capital of JavaScript, which I think is amazing. Uh, uh, it's going to happen for uh, 5th June. And uh, of speakers, as I said, is going to be Sarah Dresner and Mattia Kalina, who are very, very uh, uh, famous people who don't know Sarah. Really? Uh, almost 30% of people don't know Sarah. Oh, go to Twitter and uh, go to her website. Uh, Sarah is amazing. And Mattia Kalina, who don't know, is this guy is uh, one of the biggest contributors to Node.js. Like the fact you're running Node.js that quick as it runs now, it's mostly on Mattia. Oh, yeah, it, it's, and, and okay. Uh, who don't know Tobias Coppers? Like really? This guy made a webpack, and he is going to make an annual update. He was uh, on JS Nation this year. Next year, he's he's going to make. Uh, he he he's an author, and he runs this foundation. There is a foundation behind the webpack. Who um, th these guys are actually uh, delivering as a product, and we are. Eight, who don't use a webpack? Okay. Who don't use a webpack? Uh, one, two. Uh, okay. Uh, right, so this is an author of Webpack. And uh, we recently knew that the founder of a Node.js Foundation, which is a whole community behind Michael Rogers, is going to uh, present at the conference as well. So super early tickets are now on sale, and you can save 200 euros or something by now. That's up to you. So, okay, thank you for listening. Uh, this, uh, this is a big announcement, very important, but still, uh, today is today, and today we are welcoming Anton Nemtsev, my old friend, who finally moved to Amsterdam. Hello. I'm very glad about it, and Anton is going to, Anton works in a work spot, right? Congrats. So. Welcome, performance monitoring in the project, Anton Nemtsev. Um, microphone. <coughs> Mayday, Mayday, engine on fire. I think we need another type of dongle. If don't work.
Yes. Now it's working. Can you hear me? Not yet. So, I'm Anton Nemtsev, and uh, I'm front-end developer for 19 years. From the January, I work here in Amsterdam at Workspot, and today I'm here to talk about performance. Well, let's state the problem. Problem is degradation. Essentially, you may create best performing app ever, but in half a year, it would be actually worst. Well, couple of features, couple of node packages, and your performance is essentially dead. Our goal, how to prevent it, how to prevent degradation, and actually, first step to do it, measure, measure your performance. I think performance is quite popular, uh, but who actually measuring performance in any way? Oh, some hands. I'm glad actually to see them. Metrics. You may select any metrics you want. It's not about metrics. They hardly dependent on context, but how we may actually set the base values. Competitors will help. Take your competitors, make a list. Make a list of corresponding pages, for example, directory pages or item page. And then, well, measure performance against your competitors. Why? Because if you are chased by the bear, you don't need to be Olympic champion. You just need to be a little bit faster than other guy. <laughs> and when you get a base, add 20%. Why 20? It's a magical number. Essentially, it should mean that user can see the difference by bare eye. But who knows? It depends on con context. Another approach, use yourself to set the goals. Just check your current values and make sure you would not degradate against them. Or vice versa, grow. Or you may, for example, select a goal by time. Your page should load in, well, two seconds or three seconds. What will work? Use, for example, this tooling to check how many kilobytes you may allow. We have two types of measurements. One is laboratory, and second one is room, real user management. Let's start with first one. Essentially, all laboratory stuff happen in continuous integration. And let's pick a bundle size as easy pick. We may start with size limit. Library, it's created by Andre Sitnik. From Evil Martians, it's small, it's, well, easy to use. I can recommend it. And let's say we want to measure our NPM library size. Install the package, add some config in JSON that essentially include only the path to this library. And create an PAM script. Run it, see the size of your file, and add a limit that actually size plus something a little bit. Run it, and now the size of the library is actually checked on the basis of this limit. It may pass or it may fail and stop your pipeline. So you may reconsider or reset your limit. But now let's put it in our CI. On the example of GitLab CI and, uh, well, we using GitHub, let's add some black magic of artifacts. You may read about them here. So, it's quite ordinary. You run the script, and afterward, you set the artifact that will live for seven days, stored, well, in the root of the project, and have type metrics. Then update a little bit script. So you actually size limit generate JSON report file instead of just outputting something to the console, and create a script that will generate our artifact. 
The format is pretty obvious. Name of the, of the file, have it passed or fail your limit, and size in the byte. The script that generate metric is even more easy. You just read the JSON and output name of a metric and value. That's all. It looked like this. Metric artifact don't actually understand what your value means. For GitLab, it's just a string. And, well, that's essentially Prometheus text-based format. As a result, in your MR, you will have this block. It shows that current size and one and nine kilobytes, and before that, it was 100 kilobytes. It's quite handy to see in your MR change of some metrics, for example, bundle size, right? The format is quite obvious. Name of the metric, current value, and all value. You may check the example on GitLab if you want. But what about Webpack? In the Webpack, we actually have native configuration for performance budget. You may set hints to warning or, for example, to error, set maximum size of your entry points and for single asset. And you will see the checks and recommendation how to improve the situation or if it's set to error, it will stop the pipeline. So you may control it without any additional plugins. You may generate report file at JSON if you will run Webpack with Flex profile and JSON. But if you use Next.js, perhaps you will want to use plugin. For example, Next Bundle Analyzer, and I really love this one. You add it uh, as a decorator to a config, setting Analyte Browser to true, because we're interested in the bundle for client. And in the options, we may set analyze mode to disable it and generate static files to true, so we may get JSON report. Important, staff options, please use them and set only stuff you need, because if you just leave it by default, you will have a report of the size of 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes. It's, well, quite explicit. Afterward, you will have something like this, set or few bundles, sizes just in your merge request, and you may see if some bundle, for example, rise in size twice, you may start to dig why, and prevent the growth. We're actually using it in our company at the moment, and it's worked quite well. Check the example. But what about GitHub? Well, in GitHub, to achieve the same result, we may use GitHub Checks API and GitHub Status API. But, uh, well, who love to write the code? You just need the result, right? So perhaps we may use Ready Solution, bundle size. It's quite easy. Install it, set the configuration very similar to previous one, where you actually set a size uh, set of files and size limit for each file. Then, well, add a script to test it. Run it and get the positive result or broken pipeline that prevent delivery of huge package. In the pipeline of GitHub, well, Travis actually, we just install the stuff and run the script. And now there is a catch. To see something, we need to go in secret place and give bundle size up access to our repositories. Then we copy token and add it to the environment variable of your Travis config. You may do it with this command or perhaps with UI. After that, we will have bundle size just in our merge request. It actually show you how change the size, and if you click details, you will have information per file. 
quite nice. Yes, it may fail and it look like this. If you want to, you may actually check code checks. It's propose bundle size and aside from that, it's also propose lighthouse in beta testing at the moment, but it's nice to have everything in one place, right? But if we're talking about lighthouse, well, we may use site speed. It's open source tool that allow you to do multiple performance checks. And it's featured by GitLab. So you may read how to implement it in the documentation, but uh, who actually using it in GitLab? Ah, I see two persons, awesome. You guys, you are awesome. How we may implement it? We add in performance stage, or well, we may add uh, this rule on any stage you want. K think we should add service for Docker. Then we have a huge unreadable script that essentially just install the GitLab plugin for site speed that allow generate an artifact and then run Docker with this URI. In the demo, it's just our production URI, but in reality, you pass in there all pages you want to check, and actually it's staging, because what sense to check production? And now we add in artifact. Once again, at least for same days, and now type is performance. Performance artifact have this format, subject, you may put there a road, for example, and array of metrics. Each metric should include name, value, and desired size. Should it grow or should it versa be smaller? And then, you will have information about changes in this matrix. Now, metric um, performance artifact, it's actually understanding the values. So it's understanding how it changes, and it's quite nice. You may check the example using this link. But who need open source, fun, agile tool if we have Lighthouse, which created but huge corporate monster? To use it, we need Puppeteer and, well, Lighthouse itself. Let's install them and create a script. In the script, we may run Puppeteer, headless, and pass the browser to the configuration of Lighthouse. Then create configuration for audits. You may actually set only checks that you want to have because yay, full output of Lighthouse is giant. It's more than 50 megabytes. And then you run the Lighthouse with this configuration and against the page you need. In the demo, it's production page, but in reality, it should be set of your staging pages. Afterward, you get a report and you may check in your script all metrics you want and stop the pipeline with exiting with no zero code if you want to stop it. Afterward, you generate the report I mentioned above. Nothing fancy, just output it to the estate out and pipe it to the file. Configuration would be like this. Lighthouse updating, installing some packages, installing your application and running Lighthouse. But here is the catch. To run Puppeteer, you need all these libraries. <laughs> so either you copy them, either you Google half a day, either you actually may use Docker if you want to. <laughs> any, any way is perfectly fine. And once again, we have performance artifact. Here is we creating it, and the result would be something like that. 
You may check the example. You may also read about Lighthouse more because there's multiple interesting examples. And Puppeteer, Puppeteer is a great tool. You may do almost anything with it. And now let's actually switch to real user measurements. And let's start with server timing. Server timing is header that allow you to deliver information about something that happened on the server side to the client and show it in the dev tools and give you access with JavaScript to it. It's a name of the header, name of the metric, description of the metric, and some value. But minimal one is just name of the value. It's great tool to debug a problems. For example, you have some complex logic on the server side, and uh, you want to know if this thing was taken from the cache, or maybe you go to the database check uh, to get it. You may use server timing headers to deliver this information and check all the paths and logic on the server side. It's separated from Chrome 60, but before Chrome 65, you have quite strange format. Quite obvious, but well, strange. And it looks like this. In the DevTools, you will see additional part. This is our timing. And it never can be more than waiting till the first byte. Because, well, how can it be? Also, this is Safari. It's also supported. Let's create something simple. This is simplest possible Express server. And we may just use response object to send this header. It will work. How we measure the time between two points? With not IP process car resolution timing. It will give you an array of two integers, which contain seconds and nanoseconds. So it looks something like this. You create first mark, then pass it as an argument to the second one, and you will just get a duration. It will calculate it automatically. And to convert it to milliseconds, first part, you need to multiply on thousand, and second one, divide by million. But from the not 10, we got support of big int. That actually mean that we may just use normal mathematic without stupid arrays or stuff. Enjoy it. It's look like this and, well, read about big int. Big int is big thing. But who want to generate server headers by themselves? I create a npm package for this. Check it, it's nice. And you may install it. Once again, our simplest server, adding the package and the middleware. And after that, we may measure it quite simple this way, from to, and it will have a duration and will send it automatically. Or you may just add the full metric with name, description, and value if you got it from the third party. Also, you may not use the values and just use it to monitor some logic. Work perfectly fine. And greatest feature, you may access this data just right from the browser. You run performance get entries by type navigation, and in the navigation, you will have all servant timings. Also, if you have cross-origin request, use timing allow origin. And if you work with Firefox, use HTTPS. But real example that we use in our company, we create Apollo link. Uh, do you know what is it? Anybody work with GraphQL and Apollo links? Unexpectedly, not many, but uh, the main idea 
uh, all requests to the GraphQL server go through the links. And on both way to the GraphQL server and way back. So inside the Apollo link, we actually setting our from and on way back, our to. As a result, we may see at the moment on our stagings, timings for each GraphQL request that we made on our page. And yes, I know we monitor it also on server side, but it's many things that may happen on the side of the app. We should, if we will see some requests that take in too long, and for example, on the server server side, it take 50 milliseconds, then we will have information to investigate, to find out why it worked like that. It helps. And it supports almost everywhere. As you may see, even Internet Explorer will support it. If you scared by the number, well, actually we have Blink inside Internet Explorer now. So many new fun APIs is almost there. Read about server timing in the specification and let's switch to the performance object. We have performance to actually get information about performance now and performance observer to observe the performance events and changes while our application works. That's how the objects look like and it's, for example, Mm, contain all information about page loading. The types of performance artifacts is mark, measure, navigation, resources, long task, layout shift, first input, and it's only the start. You may check what supported in your browser with supported entries. And there are surprisingly many. You may get the list by entry type, by name or just all of them. And Performance Observer just, well, pass this information about new events to the handler and observe certain types. Entry types is array of types you need. High resolution timing to measure, well, time between some events you use performance now and time origin. Now is actually showing the distance from time origin and time origin in start of your page loading. So you get duration like this. Read about it in specification. User timing. You may set a mark anywhere in your code. For example, start task and task and fetching data in between. Then you may get the marks and you will see the timestamps of these events. Or you may use measure function between these two marks and then you will get a duration. You, well, certainly may clean this out if you don't need any more. And if you just pass the name in the measure, it will measure against timestamp of page starting loading, time origin. I mentioned it before. It looked like this. Read about it in the spec. It's supported like everywhere, so you may freely use it already. Navigation timing showing information about how your page is actually loading. So there's all events of the page like cycle. Read about in the spec. And resource timing allow you to get information about all resources that requested by your page. And even amount of these resources is good metric to check. Mm. Once again, check the spec. Long tasks. It's a great thing. It's actually showing you the functions that make UI of browser freeze. So if you have this kind of events, 
then somewhere you have too heavy function. You should log this and fix this. It look kind of like this. The specification, but now is talking, maybe they will drop this API in the favor of JS profiling API, but not sure, I'm not sure about that. Layout instability API. It's not even actually the spec yet, it's proposal, but tomorrow, uh, yesterday I find out that it's already shipped in the Chrome without any flags. Layout instability show when your layout change unexpectedly. Do you, have, um, do you ever face a situation when, for example, you scroll the mm, Twitter, you want to favorite something, but when you move mouse against the heart, it's load new bunch of tweets and tweets move and you favor in something else. It happens. And that's exactly what layout instability API checks. Use it. It's nice. And read it about it in specification. And last one, Bacon. Bacon is awesome spec that actually allow you to deliver stuff, but in a way that's not freezing your application. So it may be postponed, but it always sent, and it's never freeze anything, never block anything, and never expect of answer from the server. Let's create a server. Is for example formable to read the data, initiate it as middleware, and create endpoint report that answer with 204 status. It's requested by Bacon and means that nobody here, just everything fine, go ahead. Then let's create a script. Create a form, create some data, pass it to the forum and send this back on. You will see all the data on your server. It's happened very fast and awesome. Read about back on and use it. It's supported anywhere but 11 IE, but uh, actually we are using polyfill in our company and it's worked perfectly fine. Read the specs and even more, read the incubators, because all this contain very useful information. Maybe something you cannot use at the moment, but in a couple of months or in half a year, you will be first to implement it and first to get advantage over your concurrents. Well, thank you. I will be happy to answer any questions afterwards. I will be here well, until evening.
Does it take a take to fix a computer problem? Nothing. It's a hardware problem. Anyway, um, so I, I was coming up here. I'm going to talk about how I can write a web script with no alpha cars. Um, if you recognize the pun in that title or where that song title is, I don't even like that song. I just thought it was a cool title. But we're going to learn about filter dodging and some lessons that you might, some things you might not know about JavaScript, kind of what happens under the hood and why you can do really stupid things. Uh, a bit of a background and the contrived example that kind of leads towards this. So there's a really cool website. If you're interested in kind of security and filtering and stuff, I'd highly look at, recommend it. Look at alert one to win. And the basic premise of it is how can you write script that gets past some filtering on, say, like a comment section and would allow you to run arbitrary scripts on someone's page? Um, and so you can see there I did a whole bunch of the challenges. And I got to one called Scandia, and the gist of it is essentially all of your input to the field gets capitalized. It all becomes uppercase. And so I was trying to think about how, like, how I can get around this, and, and you kind of realize very quickly JavaScript really doesn't like uppercase. So if you type in alert, because you just want to get an alert to pop up, all, ca all uppercase alert doesn't work, all uppercase window doesn't work. So you're kind of missing out on all these object references you really want to get a hold of. And so if you're like me, you might have already heard of something called JS fuck. Um, and so I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll just use that. That's really great. Like instantly solved it. Problem is, that's 1,232 characters to do that solution. And if you look at the numbers on the right here, you'll notice that most of these answers are about the kind of 20 to 30 character mark. So that's a bit much. And so I thought, well, why don't I think about how I can optimize that uh, code and how I can get maybe yeah, how I can perhaps learn a bit more about what is JavaScript doing under the hood, why does JS fuck work, and you know, get a really nice simple solution. Uh, for those of you who don't know what JS fuck is, so JS fuck is the ability to write any compliant JavaScript with only six characters, and I'm talking this will run on the oldest version of Internet Explorer that supports you know ECMAScript three kind of thing. Um, any compliant JavaScript can be trans like can be transpiled into six characters only. Uh, the only problem is, you know, it's very long. If you want to do alert one, uh, that's 1,227 characters. The difference between what I said previously is because you add in these extra script uh, characters for filter evasion. And if you want to do something really stupid, like one, two, three, map console info, you've got 20 set, uh, 23,000 characters in your file, which is quite a few more than the kind of 12 characters or something that's up there to do that. A uh, little demonstration of what that looks like. That's the code for alert one. Um, normally I'd have like a point, well no, no, normally the screen is too small for me and I'd be able to point out that at this is Atom and the syntax highlighting stops there. Kind of third line in, but we all knew what was going on before then. Uh, and then alert document cookie, I think it fails about the first, not even finishing the first line. But you know, with syntax highlighting, it made sense at first. But once it failed, I couldn't un couldn't decrypt this. So, what is actually happening? Why is JS fuck working at all? Um, and why does JavaScript allow this? And the basic three concepts are: it's type coercion. So we're making strings from nothing. Um, and then another thing that's important to know in JavaScript is that everything is an object in JavaScript. And so. I'll go into that a bit more. So type coercion, string is king. Uh, so anything that can be a string will be a string. Uh, if you put a plus in front of stuff, it usually converts it to a numeric wherever possible. Um, and you can use things to denote truthiness, and you can invert truthiness, double invert, to get back to the truth value of it. And so this is where the fun begins, if this will allow me to swipe around, which it's not going to allow me. And that's not going to. told it to mirror, and it's not done that. Sorry, I really need to see this. So, why aren't you mirroring? And now it's lost my camera. As you can tell, I am a professional at these. OK, it's up on there. It's not on my screen. I'm going to have to turn around a bit while I do this, because otherwise I can't see what I'm typing. <sighs> Technology. 
All right, so we'll start off with simple things. Hopefully you all know what this means. So that's true, you know, one equals one. Hopefully you can all see that. One equals one is true. One triple equals one. Yeah, this all makes sense, you know. What about string one? That's true. You know, you, you know, type JavaScript does us good. Does it e does it triple equal still? That's false. You know, all it's all this is all just very valid. Makes sense. And it, is an array equal to an array? No. Kind of makes sense, I guess. If you think about object pointers, and it's definitely not triple equals. Don't worry about that. Uh, empty objects equal to empty objects. Again, false. We're mainly talking about object pointer things here. Uh, what about one triple equals to one inside an array? That's false. That doesn't make any sense. But that's true. If, it's <laughs> if you only double equals it. Um, if you do zero double equals empty array, I've put in an O there, not a zero. That's true. So, you know, an empty array is zero, but if you've got a one in it, it's true. What about four equals four in an array? Ref layer. So that's a bit weird. Um, and then we can keep going with these kind of stupid things. So zero equals not an array. That's true. That's a bit weird, because didn't we just have zero equals an array? Um, <laughs> uh, what about an A, a string A, is triple equals to that plus that string A? If I put that in correctly, string A. That's true. Um, that's a bit weird, but you know, this is JavaScript. We all just kind of fly with this. We all make sense eventually. Um, some other interesting things. We all know that one plus one equals two. Well, it would equal two if I probably typed that incorrectly. One plus one equals two. One plus string one equals 11. One plus one plus string one. 21 in a string. Um, but JavaScript does some really nice things for us because you obviously can't plus, you can't minus from a string, so it'll actually convert it back into a number for us. It's quite nice. Um, so we're going through things like that. Uh, if I want to see what the value, as I said before, you can make things into numerics if you put a plus in front of it. So apparently an array is zero, um, an array with something in it is nan. Um, we can also do interesting mathematics. So true plus true is two, too true for you. Um, true plus zero is one. So true is one essentially. Uh, true plus empty array is true though. But wasn't plus thing of zero, what? Um, so this is a kind of important thing here though. For some reason, plus as square brackets ends up as a string and when you plus a string, it turns it into a string. So true string, stringifying true is true. Um, that's, that's kind of important for why JS fuck works. And then just some personal favorites of mine, the fact that uh, an empty array equals a not, sorry, array, triple, double equals a not array because that obviously makes sense. Um, and then this is a great one that I only recently found out the explanation to. Uh, so what do you reckon this equals? Well, that equals zero. Okay. So I'm going to put that plus equals that, triple equals the same thing. That's false. But if I change this, but that way around, it's true. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. Um, and that's really just because it's actually object object um, if you swap it the other way around. And you can find out about why that is online if you really want to find out about that. Uh, I won't bore you with the details now because I probably don't have the time. And string is green. Cool, right. Back onto this. So I've shown you how we can make strings from nothing. So. First of all, what we're going to do is we're going to take an em empty array. We're going to not that, and so it becomes a false value. Then we want to stringify it, so a knotted empty array plus an empty array ends up with string of false. 
So we've suddenly got a string. Again, we've not used anything outside of our square brackets plus an exclamation mark. Um, and then if I want this, once I've got a string, if I add anything onto that string, it becomes a string. So not not of empty array is true. So I'm not gonna just keep reading out symbols here, but you get false true as a string. Um, and then if we look at that, we can figure out that from the third, second position in that string, we can get an A, third position we can get an L. We start being able to spell out the word alert. It's kind of interesting, that's quite cool. Um, if you wanna know how we get the numbers inside those brackets, remember that plus of an empty array was zero, plus um, like if you get true and then plus in front of that, that's one. So you can just plus trues until you get to whatever value you need to index in that array. Uh, if you're wondering what strings we can get a hold of, quick sample of those, true, false, uh, undefined, number, string, function, boolean. Uh, the top four are the ones that we really care about because that's got most of what we need in it. Uh, and then so the other prob thing I mentioned was that everything is an object. Um, so it turns out that everything in JavaScript has a constructor and even the functions have constructors. Um, so if you look at that, it turns out that the function constructor takes a string argument and it's essentially an eval. Um, so you can just give it a string, which we've already proved that we can get, we can make strings however much we want. Now, if we can pass that string into a function constructor, we can evaluate that string, thus getting the execution that we want. Uh, as an interesting side note on that, I could pull up the terminal if it was gonna work, but I'm not gonna. Uh, if you do, there's some interesting shortcut syntax. If you do the number two and then put two dots after it, you can use the object uh, methods of a number straight onto that number. So two, double, uh, two decimal places and you get an object reference of a number. Uh, it's really quite handy for like shortcuts and stuff like that. Uh, so I said function constructor, how are we gonna get a function constructor? So, well we always use arrays, so we're gonna get an array. Uh, arrays have methods, any array does. Uh, it's, a, it's a class methods. So any methods must have been constructed as a function, because they are a function, so they have a constructor of function. So if we can get a method and then call the constructor of that method, then we get the function uh, constructor. So we essentially do empty array, dot sort, dot constructor, and that's your function constructor. Now, you know, we can do that in, in the syntax of empty array and then an index into that array as a string. We've already proved we can get strings. And so we've just got to get the word sort and the word constructor. And it turns out the N is probably one of the harder characters to get from, from all of that. Um, but, you know, I only said at the beginning of this that I wanted to be shorter than JS fuck. I wanted to be about sh shorter than 1,200 or so characters. I want something that could fit inside a tweet or maybe just about. So we can kind of go back and, and simplify the rules of what JS fuck looks like. And we can say, well, actually, we just said we didn't use A to Z. Um, and in fact, I'm not even gonna use numbers in this, I don't think, oh, I do use numbers. Um, but I can delimit statements with a semicolon, so I can output in multiple statements. If you look at uh, JS fuck, you can't delimit statements. So every time that they want to get a letter A, they have to declare the string false again and then get an index into it and declare the string false again somewhere else. So we can delimit statements, we can have multiple statements. We can declare any variables we want to have with underscores and dollar signs. Um, and we can use object notation just because it gives us just a bit simpler to look at. So this is the solution uh, that you come up with if you do these relaxed rules. So at the very top there, we take the underscore as a variable and we make it equal to a string, true, false, object, object, undefined. And so we've delimited the statement with a semicolon there. You know, that allows me to just have one variable that I can index into to pull out the different characters I want. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up some parentheses just to hold my function constructor. I'm gonna get an empty array. I'm gonna get sort on it. So 31065 is sort in that uh, array, constructor is the nice long one underneath it, um, and then underneath that, you actually call in alert, and then there's the one character, that's a string, I've called alert one inside a function, it's all lovely and non-alpha charactered, comes out to 146 characters, so I actually made this presentation when Twitter still had a limit of 140, so I couldn't tweet it out to everyone, but 
you know, I think it's kind of glorious. It looks good. And if you want to know, like, a bit of more obviously what it does, the bottom there kind of makes it a bit simpler for you to look through it. So hopefully you're all thoroughly impressed and you thought, wow, you know, 146 characters. Guy's got it solved. He's going to do it well. Well, if you're really interested in it, there's a much shorter solution. Uh, you don't even have to really use JavaScript. Turns out that HTML doesn't give a well, it doesn't care about the casing in its tags. So script in all uppercase doesn't really matter. You just put in a script, you have a source to your local host or some sort of thing, um, and you can get it in about 38 characters. You can get it a lot shorter with, um, if you mess around with your local host file, you could just do HTTP colon X, and it would load a script off of your local machine. Um, I gave this talk to some security friends of mine and uh, one of them pointed out that in a normal website, you wouldn't even have to have the HTTP because it would take the base protocol of whatever website you were on. Uh, you only have to include HTTP here because the way that uh, Alert1 uh, sandboxes its code is that it's a data URL into an iframe. So it's not actually the same protocol. So who was I? Uh, my name is Ray L. Sashet Rushby. Don't worry about pronouncing it. Uh, I used to do embedded C systems and VHDL when I was at uni and stuff. Uh, I now do full stack JavaScript. Um, my GitHub is on there, and this presentation is on there, along with a whole bunch of other things that I do, uh, presentation-wise. Uh, and there's some, if you want to run through the JS fuck stuff, there's an automated script so you can just run it, look back, and kind of gaze at the stupidness of JavaScript. Uh, yeah, lifetime of breaking things. I always break things. That's why I kind of try and learn how they work underneath and fix them. Uh, if you want to look into this stuff, I mentioned alert one to win. Uh, the interactive me typing away in a node terminal is very heavily inspired by WTF.js by Brian LaRoe. I highly suggest checking that video out. It's really quite fun. Um, and also go visit WTFJS.com because there's a whole bunch of examples of you know stupid JavaScript stuff there. Uh, if you want to know more about JSFuck, there's the jsfuck.com transpiler. You can type in whatever code you want, get it back as jsfuck code, see what that looks like. Uh, ESOLangs has a great description on how it works. And if you want to find out how you can get every character in jsfuck, including like weird characters like an X or a Q, um, you can go to the jsfuck uh, GitHub page, and there's a giant, there's just a file that says how they get a hold of every single character in the alphabet, or every, I think you can pretty much get any ASCII character. Uh, so that has been me. Uh, any questions?
you know, s uh, okay, what's higher? Do you want the uh, mirroring? Or no, I want to switch it off. So this is for this mirror. I think this works now. Yeah, it does work. Okay, yeah. Um. Welcome, Dade. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Dade Jeremy. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to the organizers and also to everyone for um, being here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, making sense of um, symbols, iterable iterators, and um, generators. I'm a, yeah, someone you could describe as a back-end, a uh, full-stack developer, so I do a lot of um, front-end and also back-end. Uh, for front-end, I do mostly um, JavaScript, TypeScript with Angular, JS and Angular. And on the back-end, I mostly do Java and Scala. I'm also interested in functional programming. In fact, I'll be organizing the first um, Ascal Amsterdam meetup. So if by chance you're also interested in functional programming, you could, uh, yeah, we could have a chat after the, um, the talk. But today I'm not going to be talking about functional programming. I'm going to be talking about this um, interesting things that was um, added to uh, JavaScript as part of um, ES6. So basically, how did it start? Um, so I work at a place called Ripe NCC. Uh, Ripe NCC is the regional internet registry. Um, basically, what we do is we um, do a lot of interesting stuff that actually makes the internet work. So um, you could describe us as like the notary. So we keep track of who owns which IP address. There are like there are five of these organizations in the world. So um, I work in the one that is in charge of Europe, um, Middle East, and a little bit of um, Central Asia. So you have the same organization in um, um, North America, Latin America, Africa, and um, Asia Pacific. So what we do is basically very um, uh, important to keeping the internet work. So it's about int, um, networking and stuff. So when I started working about this, this was like a very different domain for me. So I wanted to like um, dig into um, the networking and the internet infrastructure. At the same time, I also wanted to learn TypeScript. So I was like, what can I do to actually like learn TypeScript while also getting to know more about the um, domain of where I work? So that's when I um, crea created um, a library called IPNOM. Basically, it's a TypeScript library. Um, it allows you to work with um, internet numbers, so IPv4, IPv6, ESNs, and also allows you to do different um, 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 IP-related um, operations on them. Um, it's, on, it's on GitHub, so in case you are writing any software that actually need to deal with this kind of stuff, please do check this, uh, this library out. But in particular, the problem I faced, or basically what I wanted to achieve that actually kind of led to me exploring some of this concept, was how do I actually iterate over a CEDAR range. In networking, um, IP addresses can be represented in something called the CEDAR notation. I'll just quickly give a brief overview of what this means. So for example, now if you have an IP, um, or if you have a notation that says 10.0.0.0 slash 30, this actually means you have a range of IP starting from 10.0.0.0 till 10.0.0.3. So basically you have an IP range of four IP addresses. Um, if you have like 10.0.0.0 slash 24, you have 256 IP addresses. If you have slash 16, then you have um, about 65,000 um, IP addresses. So the question was, as you can see, the CEDAR notation is a range-like representation. So how do I implement such representation in this library that I'm working on such that it will, you will be able to use the for off um, syntax that you can use with things like array and set with this same representation. So basically, I wanted to be able to do something that you will do with an array so you have a four off, so you create an array, you can do a four off over it. I want to be able to do that also for um, the IP CEDA structure. 
So how do I actually go to be able to do this? To actually explain this, I'm going to kind of take you through like a treasure map where we are going to touch on all of these things. And then at the end of the day, hopefully, um, we get more, um, more knowledge. So the, so the first thing we are going to do is overview of symbols. Then we are going to talk about iterables and iterators and how it actually relates with symbols. We are going to talk about um, how to actually use TypeScript to actually work with these things. And then we are going to end, or we are, we are going to talk about generators and iterators. And hopefully, at the end of the day, there will be some enlightenment. And this concept will actually be much more um, approachable. But if you feel that all of this is actually kind of um, a lot of information, so it's like five, four different concepts, and this is going to be like a 30 minute talk, and you think it's going to be like an information overload, uh, yeah, do not fret, because um, this talk is actually like a summary of a series of blog posts that I wrote around July. Um, it's five blog posts in total. It's about 7,000 words, so there's a lot of um, information. So in case I actually um, leave out some details, or in case there's some things that you actually don't understand during this talk, there's no need to worry, because you can actually go to this link, and you can actually read uh, the post. So that being said, let's start with um, symbols. So the first like code that I had to write, well, kind of that I had to kind of copy and write was something that looked like this. And at that point in time, this actually looked strange because I didn't understand why you had something in the bracket while you're actually defining a class. And that symbol that I treated thing kind of looked funny. So what was actually going on here? To start um, um, understanding this, let's first take a time out and talk about computed property keys. I'm sure most of us know that um, in JavaScript, you can actually set and uh, assess um, properties of objects via two main syntax, the dot notation and the bracket notation. By the dot notation, you have something like this. So you have a person, and you can actually set properties on it by doing dot the property you want to set and you give it a value. And you can also use the same way to actually assess this property. You can also do the same also with using the bracket notation. So instead of using dot, you put the property you want to set or assess in between a bracket. But there's a very interesting thing or like um, difference between these two, and that's because the bracket notation allows you to use variables or dynamic um, um, properties. So, like you see here, the the salutation itself is actually first set into a variable, and then you actually use that in the bracket, and then you can actually set it. So this is something that you can do with bracket notation. You can't do this with the dot notation because with the dot notation, you actually have to have the value of the property you want to set or assess. So the question is, can we also have this ability to dynamically set these properties when you're actually defining object literals? So before ES6, this is all you can do. You can't actually use um, um, the bracket notation. You can only use uh, sorry, you can't use dynamic properties. You can only use this kind of properties. But with ES6, this is a valid way of actually creating literal objects, where the properties is actually um, variable. In fact, the property could actually be a function that actually computes the property for you. And this is possible with um, ES6. So with this knowledge, this kind of starts to make sense. So what we have here is actually um, a class that has been defined, but the property of that class is actually being set using the bracket notation. So the question now is, what exactly is the thing in the bracket? It doesn't look like a function, it's something weird. That is where we go to the overview of symbols because it has to do with symbols. So what are symbols? Symbols are actually primitive types that was added to ES6. So basically by primitive type, they are in the same class like string, numbers, big int, um, booleans, 
And this is like the, um, the new um, primitive data type that was added to um, JavaScript. The unique thing about this is that they are guaranteed to be unique and immutable. Whenever you create a value of a symbol, it will always be unique and you can't actually mutate it. If you're familiar with UIDs from other programming languages like Java or C Sharp or whatnot, you can sort of think of them as UUIDs. You can create symbols of your own, but also the cool part is that JavaScript comes with some inbuilt symbols. And these symbols are usually referred to as well-known symbols. So for example, creating symbol is as simple as just calling the symbol function. And as you can see, if you create two, the two symbols are guaranteed to be unique. So they can never, ever be the same. But the question is, what can you do with this? Like, what does this give you? One of the things that I've seen people actually use symbols for is to actually avoid a case where um, you have a property in an object and you want to make sure that down the line or someone using your code doesn't actually mistakenly create the same property that you have on the object and actually override what you set. Because symbols are always unique, you can actually have the property as a symbol and then it is part of the object. So for example, now if you have the cut items, it is used for the um, property and this will ensure that no one can ever create this value that will override this. Anybody who wants to actually assess this, you have to give them the key. So that's one of the ways that I've seen people actually use symbols. But what about the well-known symbols, the ones that actually come with JavaScript? And for me, I think this is actually the coolest part of symbols. So there are a couple of them. Um, if you go to this link, you will actually see the documentation of all of these symbols. But to actually show you some of the cool things that you can actually do with the, these well-known symbols, I will pick one of the symbols. I will actually see what it does. Basically, the well-known symbols are, you can see them as some, of, as some sort of extension point where you can actually customize some of the default behavior of the language. If you're familiar with Python, you can sort of think of them as dunder uh, functions, but those are actually ways to, over, to, to, to customize um, operators. But this is more than just operators. This is like some interesting parts of the language you can actually um, customize. So for example, if, if we use the symbol, it's called the symbol to string tag. It is a well-known symbol and it's actually, it allows you to customize the string representation of objects. So let's say how it looks like. So let's say you have um, an object and you call it to string on it, you'll always get this object object. Even if it is um, 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 an object that you actually create from instantiating um, a class that you define yourself, if you call to string on it, you'll always get object object. But what if you want it to print something like this? How do you actually customize this default behavior of the language? This is where you use the symbol to string tag. So if you define your class and then you set the symbol to string tag to rectangle, if you create an instance of it, when you pr print the to string, you will get object rectangle. So this is an example of how you can use the well-known symbols to actually customize some of the behavior of JavaScript. So the question now is, what are symbols got to do with the iteration and iterable protocol? Actually, the symbol that iterator, the thing that I saw before, is actually another example of a, a well-known symbol. And what it does, it allows you to specify something called the iterator, which kind of leads us to the next point in our treasure map, where we are going to talk about iterables and iterators. So basically, what are iterable? In JavaScript, you can think of an iterable as a structure that you can loop over using the for off syntax, which is different from the for in syntax, because the for in syntax allows you to um, iterate over the enumerable properties of an object. But the for off syntax is different. So anything that you can actually loop over using the for off syntax is an iterable. And for something to be an iterable, 
it must have the symbol that iterator as its property. So that's the defining um, thing that actually makes something an iterable in JavaScript. And the symbol that iterator property that it has must be set to an iterator. So the question now is, what is an iterator? The iterator is an object that you actually use to retrieve value from an iterable. So you have the iterable, the structure you want to loop over, but for you to be able to loop over it, you have to have an iterator that actually works to actually pick values from it. In essence, the iterator is what actually makes um, iterating possible. And the iterator object itself has some certain um, shape or structure that it must adhere to. Um, it must have a next method, and then when you call that next method, it must return an object that has two properties, done and value. We are going to see how this actually works, but before we go uh, forward, let's just confirm what I just said about iterable and iterator by looking at how you can actually see these things with an array, because an array is one of the inbuilt um, iterable. So let's say you create an array, one, two, three, four, and like I said, an array is an iterable. And we can confirm this by using the symbol that iterator to actually assess its iterator. So if we call that on line five, we actually get its iterator. And now that we have the iterator, we can now use that iterator to loop through the content of that array. So basically what we are doing is actually like a manual way of looping through stuff. This is what JavaScript is actually doing um, in the background when you use the for of syntax. So you have the iterator, and like I said, the iterator must have a next um, 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 method on it. And then when you call that method, it returns another object with two values. The first value is actually the value that you're actually retrieving from the iterable, while the second value is actually what tells you whether you have reached the end of your iteration. So what you're doing here is we call the next, we check if it is done, if it's not done, we print out the next value, and then we keep on going until we reach the end. And this is possible because an array is an inbuilt iterable. But the question now is how do you make a custom iterable? How do you make an iterable um, for yourself? It's also very simple. Basically what you just need to do is to create a, um, an object that adheres to this structure. So basically it has the symbol that iterator, it links to the iterator um, object. So this is, this is one way of, of, of doing this. If I call this function, so I, I give it the first and last value. So you can see this, it's, it's a range. So it's, it, it allows you to set the first and last. And then if I call this, then I can use this with the for of syntax. So this is how to actually create something custom that you can actually use with this um, for of um, syntax. So that's, that's the idea of iterable and iterator. They work together um, to actually um, make this work. And you have inbuilt iterable, array is one of it, set is one of it, there are other um, inbuilt um, um, iterable that comes with JavaScript, but you can easily create your own, and what you just need to do is to adhere to those structures, which also leads to the next um, part. This is where we're actually going to um, see how to use a little bit of TypeScript um, to help us with what we are doing here. I'm a big fan of st um, static typing because I believe that at some point, it, um, depending on yeah, the size of your code base, it, it helps, it's a tool that actually helps you to kind of um, check uh, correctness of your program at compile time. So the question is, how do we use TypeScript when we are working with iterables and iterators to actually check if things are correct at compile time? So like I said, there are structures involved when we are dealing with this concept. Um, the structures are on the left. TypeScript provides us with interfaces that actually allows us to um, prove at compile time that the code that we are actually writing adheres to this structure. If you look at this code, I'm implementing something called iterable, and I try to use it in the for of syntax. If I'm not using 
TypeScript. This will compile, but I will get an error when I run it. But because of the fact that I'm using TypeScript, there's something missing here. And at compile time, the compiler will tell me that I'm trying to use a for of syntax, and it is not an iterable object. And basically, the fact is that I actually didn't implement the thing that actually makes something an iterable, which is the symbol dot iterator property. So we have the, the interfaces, and the interfaces just kind of enforces what I've just described. So if something is an iterable, it must have these properties. If something is an iterator, then it must have this property. One of um, two of them are optional, the return and the true, but the next is actually the defining thing that actually makes something an iterator. Then you have the iterator result. If something is an iterator result, using TypeScript, it will tell you that it must have a done, which is going to be a Boolean value, and then you, you have the value itself. And then lastly, TypeScript um, has this iterable iterator. So basically, it's a combination of iterable and iterator into one object. In some cases, you actually want the iterable itself to contain the logic that allows you to loop through it. That is when you use an iterable um, iterator interfaces. So let's quickly put these things to use. So the first um, approach, we are going to define the result. So I have the range results. It implements the iterator result interface, meaning that it must have these values. So I have this implementation. Then I create a, an implementation of the iterator and it has the next method, and then when you call it, it returns the iterator result. So this is the contract of what makes something an iterator. Then lastly, we bring everything together in the iterable. So you have the make range, um, which implements an iterable. It has the symbol that iterator, and then when you call it, it returns something which is an iterator, and this works. But the problem is, it's a little bit verbose. And that's one of the things that people complain when um, uh, people talk about type programming because you have to like type a lot of things, but basically that's not why. But how do we actually reduce uh, the verbosity here? We can do that by making use of type inference, by making use of structural typing, um, which is basically um, a type of, um, uh, it's a feature of a TypeScript where, because TypeScript supports no nominal and structural typing, which structural typing, TypeScript can infer the type of something based on the structure. So if we put these things to use, we can actually also reduce the verbosity. And then we can use the iterable iterator interface that I mentioned, because it allows us to combine two things together. So how does this look? then it becomes this. So you have the make range. As you can see, there's no need to actually explicitly say it is implementing this particular interface. The TypeScript is smart enough to actually look at the structure and then determine that, okay, based on this, this is actually an iterable. And the logic itself that you actually use to loop through stuff is part of the make range itself, which is why when you call the symbol that iterator, you return, it returns itself, because it's also an iterator because it has a next method. So putting this together, we've seen how we can actually um, use TypeScript to have some form of um, compile time safety guarantees, and we've seen how we can actually um, use some of its uh, characteristics to make the code less verbose. But there's still more that we can do, and this um, leads us to the fourth part, which is um, generators, and then how do they actually uh, um, interplay and relate with um, iterators. So what are generator functions? You can think of them as normal function that can be called, but unlike normal functions, they do not run from the top to the bottom and return. 
generator functions have um, points where you can actually instruct it to actually pause in its um, execution. So they don't run from top to the end, they actually run from top to the next, um, yeah, you can call them, you, you can see it as, some of, as a form of breaking point where uh, results get yielded and then the function itself pause until the next time you call it again. They remain paused until one trigger again and after that they actually continue to the next um, pause point and then until it reaches the last point and then the function itself um, exist, exit. So this is, a, this is a normal function that counts to three. So it starts by setting the value to zero and then it keeps on adding one to it. And then at the end of the day, it's returned one value and that will be um, three. But this is slightly different. This is a generator and one of the distinctive um, um, distinguishing property of how to define a generator is the asterisk and also the fact that it will contain a yield body, um, a yield in its body. So in this case, you set it to zero and then it runs object. And the generator object has two things. Well, it has the next method on it. So when you call the next method, it returns you a object that has value. So the next method that you call on the generator object that you get is actually how you uh, move to the next yield point in the function. So that's the, the general idea of um, generator um, functions. So how do we create them? There are various ways to actually create them, but the main thing is that there's always an asterisk in the creation of generator functions. So you can create generator functions via function expressions. You can you can create, yeah, so you can create them via function expressions, via named function expressions, via function statements, or as methods on object literals, or as method on the class. Basically, you can create generator functions just like you can create normal functions. So the different syntax that JavaScript gives for you to actually create um, uh, normal functions, there's the generator um, version of it. So this is the, function expression, you just have the asterisk. You can give your function, um, the function expression a name, it works. The function still has an asterisk. Um, yeah, you can use function statements also, this works. And if you are defining um, an object literal and you have a method on that object, you can define that method also as a generator function. So you can do, all, you can do this also, uh, yeah, this way, that way. So if you think about it, a generator allows the computation of a value one at a time. So the yield points are basically values that you actually generate one at a time. An iterator on the other hand, what does it do? It allows you to pick values from a, jet, from a data structure one at a time. If you think about it, this kind of looks similar. So the question is, is it possible to actually define an iterator using a generator? <laughs> it turns out that it's actually possible. So the previous um, definition that we had before, where you had the make range and we are defining, this is an iterable, we are defining its iterator by returning an object and we actually manually um, have the next method and then we do all of the computation that actually takes stuff from it. This can be replaced by something simpler if we apply the power of um, generator functions. So this becomes that, the symbol that iterator becomes the generator function, but instead of taking care of manually checking if, you, if you're actually done, if you're at the end of the iteration, you can use the yield part. So you keep on yielding until you get to the end. And that's, you, and that's how you can easily um, create iterators using generators. And this is more simpler and much more succinct. 
But the question is, are there other uses of generator functions? Um, yeah, there are. I've seen generator functions, or generators in general, used to simplify promises. You can also use it to implement infinite streams. In fact, in the next version of um, the library I'm working on, um, I'm using this to actually implement a huge amount because IP ranges could be very um, um, huge. And if you want to work on them, it might not be the best to actually load this into memory. So you can implement this by using um, infinite streams. And with generator, so you can actually implement um, infinite streams or big streams that you don't want to actually load into memory at once. I've seen people use it to implement unique identifiers, and I'm sure there are more cool things that you can actually do with um, generator. So to recap, um, these are the links to the four concepts that we've um, discussed. You can take a picture of it, but I'm sure this slide will be shared also at the maybe yeah with the on the meetup page. So these are the links that actually goes into these topics in depth. So recap, what did we learn today? We looked at symbols. We saw that this is part of JavaScript. It's a native um, data type. We saw that we can create symbols, but we saw that it's the well-known symbols, the one that comes with JavaScript that actually, I think is actually much more powerful because it allows us to extend um, default behavior. We saw iterables and iterators, and we saw how the fact that symbols, well-known symbols, we saw the relationship between that and iterables and iterators. Then we take a look, we took a look a bit on how to actually apply TypeScript to kind of guarantee some compile time safety. And then finally, we now saw the relationship with generators and how they actually relate to iterators and how it's possible to implement um, iterators using uh, generator. And hopefully, I hope that we've been able to reach some form of enlightenment. And if not, perhaps reading the blog post will also help with that. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>